Okay. Hold on. Two, check one, two. Should have good uh, audio now. Let me know in the chat uh, how it's how it sounds, or I will listen myself. But uh, this should be a good stream. Um, uh, we're going to talk about another one of Brian Keating's uh, latest uh, uploads. Normally, I do not like to do to talk about the same host, I guess, multiple times in a row. I, I mean, I touch on people multiple times all the time, obviously, but uh, I don't like to, I like to mix it up. But this uh, time, uh, it makes sense because last week, if you didn't see it, we covered his stream uh, with Eric Weinstein and, uh, uh, and Sabine and, um, oh man, who was it? Who else was in there? You can check it out. Um, but, uh, it was about, they were basically, they were talking about Roger Penrose and, uh, and consciousness and physics and, um, and the measurement problem. And so the panel that they had though was pretty, um, I guess, I don't want to say hostile, but they, they were not, uh, in favor of Penrose's theories. We talked about it. I think that uh, some of the statements made by some of the people on the panel last week um, were crazy. Um, I have respect for all of them. Uh, obviously, I don't think that they are crazy, but I think that some statements are, particularly those involving, um, you know, that an ob a conscious an observer can be separate from a conscious being. That is that is a crazy statement. It's not that they are crazy, but that's a crazy statement. We all say crazy statements. Um, and uh, Roger Penrose has stated before, I guess, that uh, he, he consciousness and an observer are very deeply tied. And so we're going to uh, look at the latest stream that Brian Keating did with Roger Penrose and uh, Stuart Hameroff. And uh, they basically talk about, you know, their side of this. So... I figured it was appropriate to give both sides uh, each week. Penrose's theories are fascinating to me. I kind of think that Penrose is like the last in an era of, of like the, a lineage of great OG physicists. I think you can say that doesn't, and I mean theorists, but specifically, I don't mean experimentalists. Um, but. Uh, then we have this new group coming up that is like the next gen physicists, but they're more like metaphysicists. People like Donald Hoffman um, and uh, Eric Weinstein, I would even say, um, and uh, Carl Friston. I'd include myself in that. Um, uh, Yosha Bach for sure. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of them. Um, uh, even, um, Chris Langan. So they, there's, this is a new different kind of group. And what's interesting is that almost none of them are physicists by degrees, by, uh, academic accreditation. Some of them are like maybe one or two, but it's like one or two. Uh, I don't, I, I think that Penrose is like the last of, you know, this, the, the era of, of, uh, I guess you could say 20th century physicists and, uh, you know, he's 91 years old, so he, he's, he's not young, but, uh, I, I think that his conformal cyclic cosmology is really onto something. It's very similar to sentient singularity theories, cosmology in that it seems to be at least, um, uh, uh what he calls an aeon, I seem to call a cosmological verse um or a verse and um and then his ideas on consciousness i think are much truer than any other any of the other physicists um that aren't really that don't believe that believe that you can detach an observer uh from 
a, con a conscious being and uh, an observation from a conscious being essentially and uh, we're going to talk more about that in a minute but uh but yeah i mean i think uh i, I we're going to talk though tonight about how i don't think that i don't agree with how i think consciousness is an ever present and that you have to orient yourself properly in order to see it in every instance of objective observation and he seems to think that it starts um uh, I guess with microtubules and I will say I am coming around to the importance of microtubules but I don't believe that they are where consciousness comes from but we're going to talk about it all tonight um feel free to uh you know put any questions in the chat at any point and I will get to them um please hit the like button uh, it really helps with the algorithm and um with that let's get started okay so this is the stream that we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, it's part one and part two. Uh, it's linked below. And uh, they had some technical issues the first um, uh, a bit, after, about 30 minutes in, so they had to restart. And, but you start with part one, then you go to part two. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, and we always go over everybody. So Brian Keating, um, I know personally, and I have an enormous amount of respect for him. I've worked with him before uh, when I was at PragerU multiple times. And uh, I, I helped film the video, God or the Multiverse. Uh, you can look that up uh, with him, and I think it's a great video. But I think you can do God... I would say, personally, when it comes to cosmology, I would say kind of God and the multiverse, not God or the multiverse. I think that they are not, um, they're not mutually exclusive, but he's not even making that claim in that video either. Um, but it's a great video. Uh, these monologues will help the algorithm. Yeah, it's okay if someone does not respect, yeah, it's okay if someone doesn't respect Brian Keating, but I respect Brian Keating. Um, so I don't know why you wouldn't respect Brian Keating. Uh, he's, I mean, you can just, you you should respect everybody, but uh, I I guess like if you have beef with him, then that's fine. But I don't. <laughs> I think he's very brave, and he's one of these people. Him and Kirchheim Mungle, especially like the two of them, and and Lex Friedman. Um, I'll I'll I'd include him in there. It's just he's a little less specialized, so it's. It's not as, um, and he does one-on-one -on -one interviews more, so it's not exactly the same. But Brian Keating and, and Kurt Mongol have really taken this huge scope of like theories of everything and this space of of metaphysics that's kind of borderline physics and um, and borderline philosophy and where, but this in this space nobody talks to each other. And so the two of them have definitely created aggregation points for all of this uh, information and all of these people's ideas and theories. And that is invaluable. I mean, it is. it was so necessary to advancing this conversation further and, um, and advancing science further, I think. So I have respect for both of them uh, for doing that. I mean, you have to be able to entertain ideas that most people in this scientific community, when this first started at least, now it's branching out, did not entertain. They were not willing to discuss it. Uh, I mean, UFOs and God are pretty... I mean, three, four years ago, probably four years ago, you couldn't even speak about these things uh, in, you know, academic discussions. But Brian Keating is... Uh, is a experimental physicist. Uh, he wrote um, the book uh, "Losing the Nobel Prize," and uh, he is, I believe, the head of the physics department at uh, UC San Diego. He's a co occupation cosmologist. Is listed online, but. Uh, he's host of the Into the Impossible podcast, which is linked below, which is great. Um, I definitely recommend subscribing. Next, we have... Oops. 
Stewart. Stuart Hameroff. Stuart Hameroff is an American anesthesiologist and professor at the University of Arizona. That's where I'm from. I'm from Tucson, where the University of Arizona is um, known for his studies in consciousness. It's controversial contention that consciousness originates from quantum states in neural microtubules. I do believe that there's no separation between quantum states and consciousness. A consciousness is a quantum object. And I know people say things like, oh, people just use the word quantum to sound, you know, like scientific. They're wanna, they're, it's a great word to use if you use if you're trying to convey the idea that it's it, there's like a singular self-contained holonic structure, um, and the reality is is that quantum mechanics are entirely linked to consciousness. Um, so there is to say quantum and mix it with the term consciousness is natural, uh, even though I understand it's very overdone by a lot of people that do struggle to explain in a detailed way their thoughts on why they should be linked. Um, he is the lead organizer for the Science of Consciousness Conference. Anesthesiology, I, I thought about being a doctor actually and going to the University of Arizona and, uh, and the doctor that I wanted to be was an anesthesiologist. But you, if you misplace zero, then you kill someone. That's not the only, that's not the reason why I didn't go into it, but uh, it was a concern. But it's fa it's a fascinating um, study, um, field of study is anesthesiology. And it's, it's also, it pays well. And it's, it's just, I always liked, it's just, a, it's just fascinating. I mean, it's just fascinating, but um it's a good, I, I think that it's fascinating that he is involved in this discussion too, coming from being an anesthesiologist. That's a very unique perspective. It's very like hands-on um, and uh, it's, it's almost like he's an experimental neuroscientist, but we're going to talk about neuroscience uh, in a bit because he said some things about neuroscience that I totally agree with. This stream Last stream was very, I was very critical and, and much more critical than I normally am because I really, really disagree with this idea that you can separate uh, a conscious being, a sentient being from a measurement. You can't. You cannot just, you can't, Sabine last week was saying things like, well, you don't need a consciousness or a conscious being in order to make a measurement. You just need an apparatus. That's... In, that's insane and um, you need a conscious being to have an apparatus that makes a measurement that you know is in any way contextualized and useful but um, uh, he ended up working with Hameroff ended up working with Penrose and um, I'm reading their criticisms. Tegmark was a critic of them. You can read here. Physicist Max Tegmark calculated the quantum states in microtubules would survive for only 10 to the negative 13 seconds. Too brief to be any of any significance for neural processes. Hameroff and physicist Scott Hagen replied to Tegmark arguing that microtubules could be shielded against the environment of the brain and that Tegmark had used his own criteria for the reduction of the wave function. Did not use Penrose's orchestrated objective reduction, which we're going to talk about. Yeah. Lead organizer of the first Tucson Tour de Science of, Con of Consciousness meeting. I should go there. That's pretty cool. I I don't know how many of you have been to Tucson, but that's my uh, 
my, what is it called, stomping grounds. Tucson is oddly home to like all kinds of weird mixers, like the Gem and Mineral Show and like all kinds of things. And it's, it, I don't understand why when you have Phoenix, um, probably because of the University of Arizona, which is the like the flagship university of, of, um, of Arizona. I went to Northern Arizona University, which was the hippie town. Um, okay, so next, a man who needs no introdu introduction, but we're going to introduce him anyways, Roger Penrose. An English mathematician, mathematical physicist, philosopher of science, and Nobel laureate in physics. He won the Nobel Prize, I believe, last year um, or the year before. The Consciousness. The Emperor's New Mind. I need to get that book and read it, but... I am admittedly pretty bad about reading um, other people's work. I do have his um, his other book, though, um, A Road to Reality, but I haven't read it. Honors and Awards. I'm not a believer myself. I don't believe in established religions of any kind. He talks about this in this um, interview. He basically says, I'm an atheist. And he said, by atheist, I mean I don't believe in any organized religions. He did not say that he doesn't believe in God. And he implies that he would be open to the idea that there is an afterlife. So I think he could be open to the idea that there is a God, at least. He doesn't say, I am I don't believe in God. He says, I don't believe in God in religion. He regards himself as an agnostic. And in a brief history of time, he also said, I think I would say that the universe has a purpose. It's not somehow just there by chance. Okay. Some people, I think, take the view that the universe is just there and runs along. It's a bit like it just sort of computes and we happen to somehow by accident find ourselves in this thing. But I don't think that's a very fruitful or helpful way of looking at the universe. I think there's something much deeper to it. Okay, so I would say he leans towards theism. I mean, that that's pretty clear right there. If you believe the universe has a per was, was created for a purpose or has a purpose, then I would argue you're leaning towards theism. And uh, we all know, like, the Penrose, um, the Penrose stairs. What's interesting is, if you look at a Penrose stairs, it's Penrose staircase. And you look at... Here's a Penrose staircase. And then you look here. Check this out. Come on. Okay. Here, look at this. It's pretty amazing. This is my cosmological verse. Clear, though. I deleted all the values and things um, and coloring and... Um, and labels and this is a penrose staircase and if you look at this 
it's basically like a Penrose staircase on steroids. You can go up the steps, across, down the steps, across, up the steps, across, down the steps, across. It's basically this, which is interesting. Um, sometimes I just stare at it and I like think about running like along this and uh, it just it, it just is interesting. But uh, with that, let's get into the first clips. We're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about the measurement problem. We're going to talk about a lot. Okay. This first clip is about uh, Schrodinger's cat. And I talk a lot about this sometimes. I probably should talk more about it um, because this is one of the most misunderstood. It's, it's not even misunderstood. It is not understood um, in, thing in physics. So we're going to uh, discuss it. But I, I basically agree with what kind of what he's saying here but i'm going to elaborate even more and we're going to use a model okay and that's why he considered this thought experiment of a cat in the box and you put this cat to into a superposition of being dead and alive and shredding him and say look this is ridiculous you couldn't have a cat dead and alive. But lots of people say, oh, we'll have to try and make a machine which actually makes a cat dead and alive. But Schrodinger was pointing out that quantum mechanics as understood, in other words, following his equation, gives you nonsense. It tells you that you have cats that are dead and alive at the same time. Now, some people would take the view they did in the early days of quantum mechanics that you need a conscious observer to come along and it's the conscious observer who looks at the quantum state, and that makes it be one thing or another, rather than both things at once. Now, that's ridiculous in a way, and I don't want to go into why it's ridiculous, but it was very strongly held by quite a lot of very distinguished physicists in the, in, at the time. Now, you see, the view I hold is almost the opposite of that. It is that the state does reduce itself, that is to say, the cat becomes either dead or alive spontaneously, not because anybody looks at it or even the cat looking at itself, but because this superposition is too big in a certain sense, and that it spontaneously becomes one or the other. And it, has, and it, and it does this with something much, much smaller than the size of a cat. It's a very tiny effect which could make it go, become one or the other. And this involves, in my view, um, bringing the general theory of relativity, and this is Einstein's theory of gravity, curved space-time, and all that sort of thing. And when you bring this into quantum mechanics, you find that you have a conundrum. And the, the way, out, way of resolving this conundrum is to say that instead of having these superpositions of two things at once, there is a certain lifetime of that superposition, and the bigger the superposition is, the shorter the lifetime is. So... Okay, so I'm not, Penrose is difficult to understand, so I'm not, and I haven't looked enough into his work because there's so much out there, and I also try and stay away from going too deep into other people's work because I don't want to be swayed unconsciously by other people's work. I am looking more into people's work now because of this show and, um, or these streams, uh, and also because I basically finished my, my models, um, my main models, uh, so I don't, it's not as difficult for me um, to like not have an idea already in place. But I will say Penrose is sometimes especially difficult for me to understand. Uh, I can kind of like intuitively get it, but that doesn't mean that I really get it. So, um, but I am going to try. And uh, so let's talk about this Schrodinger's cat thing because this is nonsense he's right this is total nonsense this idea that the cat is dead and alive at the same time is nonsense anybody that says that it's not nonsense doesn't understand quantum mechanics i'm making that claim and also um 
this is this has just become kind of a widespread statement that is like um it's done for shock value you know you go on joe rogan or something like that and you're like a physicist and you're like you know the cat is dead and alive at the same time that is not what is even being stated what what this superposition state is when it is of 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 whether or not something is wave or particle is when it's extrapolated out to organisms the level of organisms is are you an assembly of cells or are you a single organism and essentially you could just say are you an assembly or are you a singularity okay are you a holonic structure of are you one or are you many that's the that's the question here with this this um wave versus particle question that and this this schrodinger's cat basically the answer is yes so that just implies that the question was wrong so to say is it a particle or a wave that is a bad question the you the answer is it's a particle and a wave and it depends on how you're looking at it and what you see so I've used this thing before many times to explain this and uh, if you know you can see it is a square and it is squares multiple and it is also a wave and it is also a helix okay so when I ask you it, let's say this is the object like this is the cat right here and I asked you is it a particle or meaning is it a square so if i say do you see the square you'll be like yeah if i'm like do you see the squares you're like yeah do you see the wave yeah do you see the helix yeah so what is a cat it's a wave of movement of a multiplicity of us that is that making up an uh that is an assembly that makes up a, a singularity of sentience and which is a cat and it is you know multiplicity of cells and it is also every time you move it is a wave okay so you move your arm it's a wave a cat takes a step it's a wave also and i'm not saying this is the only explanation but this is an explanation these when you're talking about consciousness you're always going to deal with superpositions. So this might not be the only answer to this, but it is an answer that is accurate. And, um, but also a cat is its DNA. It is a helix. It is a helical structure uh, as well. You could say that cat's DNA is the cat. So this is what it really is. It's, I don't know what he means, Roger Penrose, when he says when you when you make an observation, it spontaneously is either dead or alive. I don't know what he means by spontaneously. Um, I need to look into his work more to understand why he what he means by that. If he means random, then I disagree with that very much. So, but I also think that. Um, uh but i don't know if that's what he means but this this statement that he's making about bringing in general relativity and then it kind of like adds time to the equation and that there's a time span where it's alive or dead that might be the case i mean it certainly seems like it is the case um and you can look at that with sleep um you know when you're asleep you're like an assembly of cells almost but when you are awake you are a singularity of human and uh when when you sleep what happens is is your your sentience of your human sentience your consciousness takes time off essentially and lets the cells off the hook it's almost like they're the workers uh, of you know corporation and jeff bezos just you know let everybody go on vacation and so they can all go home and clean their houses and feed themselves and get some rest and uh 
you know, organize their lives, create order in their space is what I uh, say a lot is. So when you're awake, you can create order in your space. When you're asleep, your cells create order in their space because you're, you override whatever they're uh, doing while you're awake. So in order for them to be free, you need to free them by going to sleep. So this alternate, this is basically like alternating current, asleep, awake, asleep, awake, asleep, awake. You could say that that is kind of like, that is your multiplicity, then your singularity, or you're a particle and a wave, a particle and a wave, you're a particle when you're awake, you're a wave when you're asleep, particle when you're awake, wave when you're asleep. But you could also say that, uh, you know, when you first start forming as a zygote, at some point, you're, I don't know, you're, maybe you are not a sentient singularity yet, you're just an assembly of cells. I don't know. Um, but uh, you're probably, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, there's definitely a point, but it might be that at the initial point, I don't know. But then when you die, as soon as you die, that doesn't mean that your cells are immediately dead. Um, you, your cells are still alive and they're going to slowly die. And at that point, you are a wave. So as soon as you die, you go from a particle to a wave. So there, that is time, kind of time dependent. I don't know if that's what he means, but it doesn't seem like it. But it does seem like that is that makes sense, even though I don't know exactly how he means it. Uh, he's starting to... I, I don't look at it the way that he does. I think that... Um, I don't know. We need to get a little more like super physical, not like in or in the way that we look at this, and not so physical in terms of like looking at the brain. We need to start looking at our being, which is kind of almost non-physical, but it's also I, you could call it super physical. Um, but uh, I agree with him though that this this idea that anything is a dead and alive at the same time is nonsense. This was. And the issue is, is that this has become such a gee whiz like statement everywhere. And, you know, I feel like people who are into physics say this stuff all the time. And and then it kind of makes whoever they're talking to feel like stupid. But because you kind of feel like you're not this person gets it, but I don't get it. Nobody gets it. it does. There's nothing to be to get. There is no instance in which something is dead and alive at the same time. This, the terminology here is wrong. It's a particle or a wave, and what is a wave must be understood first, which is a multiplicity uh, within, within an, ob an objective wave is multiplicity um, of sentient beings, essentially. And so and they form to one sentient being. So it's a sentient singularity um, and uh, or sentient singularity made of sentient singularities. And this, this idea starts to make perfect sense and it's not difficult to understand. You're a particle, meaning you're an organism and you're an assembly of cells. Each cell is a cell and it's an assembly of molecules or, um, you know, this, we're going to talk more about this later, but assemble, an assembly of molecules, essentially. And uh, this is the right way to look at it. This, we need to get rid of this statement of Schrodinger's cat being dead and alive at the same time. There's literally no use to it in physics. Um, it's just confusing everybody. So, can you test consciousness within the limits of sobriety? I suppose you have defended the need for grifters. I don't know what you mean. I suppose you have defended the need for grifters. Because people... This... Oh, like people who take... Who latch on to like... I don't know. Other people working? And are you talking about when I said that there are people who aggregate, uh, you know, the works of multiple people? Is that a grifter? 
I don't think that that's a grifter. I don't really like... A grifter... I mean, I don't like the word grifter. I think that, you know, it, the people who aggregate other, who, who t you know, who interview and talk to many others and kind of aggregate ideas into um, a single place are very important. The We only start calling them grifters when we feel like there's almost nothing to be gained by from them anymore. And I don't know what the exact definition of a grifter would really be, but, um, but I would say somebody, as soon as somebody's willing to like start compromising on, on, uh, their original mission and they're just doing it for money, I'm not making a judgment here, but like, I would say that is where, you know, Maybe you could call him a grifter, but I don't consider any of those, either of the two guys that I mentioned grifters. They're, and, and whether or not you're a grifter is also time dependent. Most of the people who are called grifters that I, who have been called grifters, who I've, you know, seen are people who for quite some time were producing extremely, you know, valuable content and then just started, I don't know chasing paycheck maybe which i mean to each its own like everybody's got to eat but um i tr i don't like the word grifter people people will accuse me of being a grifter because of the way that i do these streams that's not uh, my intention i i don't have any negative intentions i'm fully honest about my intentions i want to give my opinion on what these people are saying i want to get involved in this discussion and uh, through multiple means, and that means also sharing my thoughts on how their ideas relate to sentient singularity theory and all kinds of, you know, things like that. I'll also be doing interviews uh, later this year uh, once I'm done up upgrading uh, some of the hardware uh, over here. We need more storage and we need a uh, better computer and we're getting better internet. So there's there's things being done with that. But I'll still continue this. I uh, I don't think that it's, you know, you're a grifter just because you talk about other others. But there are people, I will say, that don't, uh, that it's not valuable. And I won't say there are people that are not valuable in when they are talking about others. But there there is a lot of content out there that is not valuable when talking about um, others. And I would say that those usually involves like starting beef for the sake of fake internet like fights. And, uh, but if you're trying to give out your honest thoughts on something, your commentary, that's not a, being, a, I don't think that that's a negative thing. I won't even say that's not being a grifter because I don't know what a grifter is anymore. I don't think these words have any meaning. They just mean bad, <laughs> bad and like, I don't know, just like coattail riding or something like that. But uh, hey guys, what's going on? Jan and Tyler. Um, sounds like a lot of source code. Uh, he only said it because it sounds ridiculous. The cat isn't both. Yeah, the cat is not both. I'm a grifter. Who isn't a grifter? I don't know what a grifter is. But next clip. Um, I will say, by the way, when Roger Penrose is saying that a lot of physicists thought that when you look at consciousness, or when, when a conscious being looks at, makes an observation and looks at something, it collapses the wave function and makes it either dead or alive, essentially, is what he's saying. I used to kind of, makes it a particle or a wave. I used to believe that too. But that's not really exactly the right way to explain what's happening. Um, a lot of physicists, like you said, thought that because it really does appear to be that that's what's happening. But that's not exactly what's happening. What's happening is, is that you can only focus on one attribute at a time. Uh, and like if I asked you, you know, what what shape is this? Like you're going to be like, it's a square. 
and I'm like, oh, so it's not squares? You're going to be like, well, it's also squares. You're going to be like, well, so it's not, you know, a helix? You're going to be like, well, it's also a helix. Well, it's not a wave. It's also a wave. So it's it, it has to do with the constraint of mind and and that constrains how we communicate and also how we observe things. So when we look at like an electron, electron is a wave. Um, it's funny, like people talk to me about the one electron universe all the time. There is a wave of information that is happening in the fiber bundle of the universe and it's moving and you're looking at making and when you make an observation the constraint of focus makes it so that you can only see a point of that wave at a time the point of that wave that you see in specific instances is an electron so an electron is a point on a wave. It's not a particle like a proton is a particle, obviously, for those of you who know quantum mechanics. It's not, you know, it's not a compound structure. There's, it's an elementary particle. So any elementary particle is going to be basically a point on a wave. Um, and it's not... The, this... The, the word particle is thro is probably bad. It's probably a bad word. Uh, I talk about the, you know, bad words a lot, I, like idealism and materialism, I think are just bad words. Um, uh, and also, you know, I don't know, like alive is probably like a, a bad word. Um, life is probably a bad word. What is life? What is a, what is a living thing? Um, uh, I think a li the term living thing is, is a bad word or bad term. Like there's lots of bad, bad words in that they are giving you a perspective that doesn't allow you to take something further. So when you talk about the term life, for instance, and people are like, well, where, where's the origin of, what's the origin of life? Okay. Well, what is life? Life is, um, you know, cells and above. Okay, that's not true, first of all. If if life is well, anything at all, then it is sentience, and sentience is more than just cells and above. So, um, and if you really understand it, there is no origin of life. There's a creation point in which the universe and multiplicity of sentience is created, but you, there is no origin of life. Existence is a living is is a sentient being. It's alive. Like so, there is no dead and alive in objectivity. There's beings and things, and beings are fundamental, and things are emergent perspectives. You know, and that's it. They're not fundamentally. They don't fundamentally exist. So. Certain words can just lead you astray, and uh, uh, these a lot of these are like that. Materialism, idealism, they both lead you astray too because they're just two sides of one coin. And the idea that one of them, to call yourself one or the other, it, it, that, to say I'm a materialist, is basically to say, like, I only believe it in tails. Like, if you're looking at a coin and some and somebody's like, I believe in in coins, or, or what do you believe about coins? And somebody's like, I believe in tails. And somebody else is like, I believe in heads. It's like, I believe in coins. You, you know? Like, there's... Terminology matters an enormous amount, my, to such a degree that it's it's almost... You can't overstate it. Um, my ability to do this is because I nailed like the what I call the four primary perspectives. Uh, I like wrote them down and tried to figure out how do you transcend relativity and still orient yourself. And I came up with the four primary perspectives of inside, outside, separate, and oneness. And once I did that, that's it uh, allowed for me to do the rest of this work. I never would have been able to talk about this stuff the way that I can 
or model it the way that I have. If I didn't do that, uh, I would be right where most of most a lot of the people in this consciousness physics panpsychism ish space are, um, and it's just kind of vague and hand where it, it's it's accused of being vague and hand wavy. It's because of an inability to linguistically describe in an oriented and specific way like what is going on in is in the relationships of consciousness but i don't think consciousness makes a part something a particle or a wave it's just are you looking for a particle or are you looking for a wave and uh in in the way that you're observing it is the reality and sometimes you can only see a point of a wave and you can't see the full wave because it's the universe itself so good luck seeing the entire universe next clip uh this is on a term that he he called proto consciousness i we're gonna think about it a bit but it's not um i don't really understand it they're choosing one or the other rather than both at once. Now, process is something outside standard quantum mechanics, but it's something which you can make predictions about if you bring Einstein's general theories of relativity into the picture. And it gives you a time scale for how long the superposition can exist before one or the other happens. The claim we make is that each time this choice of whether one thing or the other happens, that's what we call proto-consciousness. And as I say, it's the building block out of which actual consciousness, which is, involves many, many of such processes, actual consciousness comes up. It sounds like what he means by proto-consciousness is what I call just perspective. So I, I say like a conscious being or like a, a sentient singularity, a sentient being, or is a mind essentially. And a mind is an assembly of entangled perspectives. And... Um, and the thing about perspectives is that that are entangled is um is that they are co-creative so like you the thing about like inside outside separate and oneness this quadratic you know manifold of of perspectives i guess you could say uh that is kind of the backbone of of sentient singularity theory is that um they are co-creative of each other so you can't in, if i say inside then in order to understand inside you have to also have an understanding of what is outside if you if you know that something is inside if i if you're like and if i if you said you're describing me and you're like he's inside that means you also have to know what's outside and you also have to know what is me and you also have to know one with aka one with me and you also have to know what is separate from me because what am i inside what is outside of me is separate from me what is what i what i am inside of is uh is separate from me to some degree now that's when you're talking about the relationships between consciousness um this is kind of how it breaks down essentially so oneness is inside and outside of se separateness you could say um outside is separate from oneness inside is separate and oneness it's different uh this is from this is and very important separate is inside or outside of oneness and uh so they are defining of each other so once you have this bit of information you can't have this bit of information without also all these three other bits of information and if you have all three other bits of information then you have this one but if you have this one then you also have these in in a way so you you have to have all four at the same time essentially is the point so uh they're entangled okay they're entangled perspectives and i think that when he says proto-consciousness, it's almost like an observation. These various observations are various perspectives that sum to a consciousness. 
are, I call them quantum of consciousness or quantum of cognition. I, I don't know what to call it. Let me know in the chat what you think I should call this. But I call it, right here it's labeled quantum of cognition because I just thought consciousness was so overused. But it was originally a quantum of consciousness. And it's basically the self-reflective calculation, essentially, where this thing is calculating itself. So basically, like if I say, think about yourself and you think about, you picture yourself in your own mind, this is the mathematical representation of that. And I can explain that later. But um, I, I think that... Basically, what it is, is it's you have a bit of information, one input of information, you start with one here, and then it's through symmetry structures, it builds information from the one. And uh, that is base. a number of these can sum to a conscious being. So a quantum of consciousness is like, I'm aware of a feeling that I have or something like that. And then that can, that when put into context with other observations like, or perspectives, gives you you, essentially. You can't get into it too deeply now, because I'm trying to keep this to two hours. Uh, I've been pretty bad about going over time, but we will talk more about it. But um, I'm not sure if that's what Penrose means by, by proto-consciousness. Eric Weinstein used the term proto-consciousness, I think, um, when he was describing the universe before creation i think he said like something almost conscious but not quite conscious or almost sentient but not quite sentient i mean i disagree with that the you know, there there's been nothing but sentience there's never been an an existence in which sentience is not that existence itself but uh but i don't so i don't know if i don't like the word the even proto-consciousness or or almost sentient because there is only sentient and not sentient and there's also a, it, when you're thinking about things in its totality of what we observe in the universe there's you know your this pen is not sentient the molecules in it i believe are sentient uh we'll talk more about it in a bit but the atoms in it are sentient and I think the pro uh, the protons and neutrons in those molecules are sentient as well, but uh, the pen is not. And um, uh, so there is no gray area of like almost sentient, but not quite sentient, or far from sentient, or totally sentient. There's just sentient and not sentient. And uh, th there's like. People, they, we'll, we'll look, take a look, uh, but Hammeroff is talking about like cells in, in this interview, and he's like, they're, they're, you know, maybe they're conscious, maybe not, but, um, but they're at least intelligent. There is only, in, there's no such thing as intelligence outside of sentience either. Um, intelligence is part, of, is a quality of a sentient being. Um, but uh, it's, so I, in regards to Penrose's statement, I guess, like about proto-consciousness, I would just say the term is bad for whatever he's trying to describe. But I think what he's trying to describe is just an aspect of a conscious being. Maybe he's talking about, I don't know, like uh, the organelles in a cell or something like that are proto-consciousnesses and then a cell is conscious. Uh, who knows? I'd have to like look more into it. But even then, that's that's still a, not a good word to use because there's just sentience and uh, there's just sentient beings and non-sentient things. Next clip. I will say though, I am coming. I think microtubules are more important than we than I originally thought. I, I basically said that I didn't think that they were important for anything. I didn't really also know exactly what they were. Like, I looked into them, but I couldn't... It will, I, I'm still learning what, about them. I do think that it makes sense that they are... They might be sent, like sentient. Um, but I don't know. They might be like sentient macromolecules. 
I don't, I, I need to look more into it before I make any claims, though. About that book uh, that caused you to take the risk and, and, and start this relationship with Roger that's persisted for the last 30 plus years. Right. Well, I had, uh, at that point, uh, in the early 90s when I read it, uh, been studying microtubules inside cells and particularly inside brain neurons. I had, I got interested in microtubules in medical school and studying uh, uh, mitosis in a cancer lab where the, these mitotic spindles, which are microtubules, pull apart the chromosomes in a very highly orchestrated dance to get exact separation of uh, uh, duplicate pairs of chromosomes that go on to each becomes the daughter cell. And if that isn't perfect, then you get uh, you can get uh, cancer, you can get maldevelopment, and so forth. And so everybody else in the lab got really interested in the chromosomes being the dawn of the genetic uh, revolution and so forth in the early 70s. But for some reason, I got fascinated with these structures which seem to know where to go and what to do, it seemed to have some kind of intelligence. And I had been interested in consciousness from my undergraduate days. And so I wondered whether these uh, structures, which turned out to be microtubules, might be processing information. And I was primarily interested in the brain and um, uh, thought that they might support uh, processes inside neurons uh, leading to consciousness. Because if you think about the neuron as a simple on-off switch, as most people do, the brain is a complex computer of simple neurons then you treat each neuron as a one or a zero. But actually, if you think of a single cell organism, like a paramecium, it swims around, it finds food, it finds a mate, it has sex, it can learn. It's very clever. It doesn't. It, I'm not saying it's conscious necessarily, although it might be, but it has intelligence and it, it uses its microtubules. So at that time, the structure of microtubules was discovered to be a lattice, a cylindrical lattice with, in some cases, Fibonacci geometry. And I spent a number of years uh, uh, looking at uh, information processing models in microtubules as, as basically molecular uh, scale computers, uh, which increase the uh, information capacity uh, inside neurons tremendously. Uh, about a billion tubulin switching at 10 megahertz gave you 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron, whereas uh, neural net people, AI people, the singularity people were saying, no, there were 10 to the 16th operations per second in the entire brain. And when that was met, we have brain equivalents and consciousness. And I was going around being a pain in the rear end to AI people saying, no, your, your target's way, way downstream. You're being uh, naive and, and insulting the neuron by saying it's a one or a zero. And they would say things like, go away, kid, you bother me, you know, what do you know? And, uh, and, and, but then one day somebody said something very, very, important and profound to me, he said, let's say you're right. How would that explain consciousness? You have all this information processing at a deeper level, and you have 10 to the 27th instead of 10 to the 16th operations per second. How would that explain feelings, love, joy, emotion, the color pink? And I had to admit, I didn't know, and I was a bit stunned to be categorized as a reductionist, but that's what I was. But fortunately, that person suggested I read Roger's book, The Emperor's New Mind, which I did, and I was really fascinated and blown away by it. The bottom line being that he had a mechanism for consciousness, and nobody else did. Before, everybody else, it's, it's, or even still today, kind of hand-waving arguments about complexity, emergence. Uh, maybe it's fundamental, maybe it's panpsychism, but you know, who knows. But he had a specific mechanism, which at the time I didn't understand and still don't completely understand, but I've, I've certainly studied and pondered it um, uh, for many years. And so I thought, you know, in the end of his book, he said, well, we need uh, a quantum computer in the brain that will collapse by his OR mechanism. And uh, he, was, he mentioned that, you know, neurons, axons firing and not firing, that superposition of his, it was too large scale. And I agreed. And I wrote to him and I told him about microtubules and that they might be the quantum computer collapsing by his objective reduction that he was looking for. And uh, he, uh, he agreed enough to, uh, so that we met in his office. I happened to be going to England. Okay, so microtubules. I do think that you need a quantum computer in order to have a mind. I don't like this focus on the brain in Penrose's work, um, to be honest, and, and even with Hammeroff, it seems. It, to focus on the brain is to miss the point. Uh, and this is a huge problem with 
the neuroscience neural network people um, that he's talking about is their focus on the brain and um, uh, and the idea that also you know it's just an, a neuron is just an on off switch it is an on off switch it's not just an on off switch you are an on off switch but you are not just an on off switch you're also an on off switch that has the ability to make choices and imagine and this ability of making choices and imagine and having imagination go hand in hand and they are only it's only possible to do that in like a quantum computing um uh environment essentially because you need the the ability to, for superposition to exist essentially in order to imagine so you need like it's like uh if you're thinking about something and you're like i if i throw the ball it's either going to go straight or it's going to you know not and or i'm going to hit i'm going to throw it to that person's mitt or it's going to hit the window but this is this per ability to perceive superposition of events before they happen essentially is a quality of imagination and uh it's something only quantum computer essentially allows for or quantum computation allows for traditional computing does not allow for that because everything is deterministic um but you are both you are a computer and you are a quantum computer and you're also more than that and uh so your your ability to your iq is a computer is traditional computing essentially your your but your sentience your you, is like quantum computing it's diff two different things you can be sentient and have a range of iq uh kind of show this is um i've been working on some models um uh for uh a part of the paper that i'm writing and um here check this out information change okay so here you go What's interesting is, so I have a video on my, um, on my YouTube, but if you go information, change, It goes through on my YouTube channel. You can look at it. It's called information change or something like that. Um, uh, but it shows each, it goes through each of these states in these various, ma in, in these matrices. And I think I did it on there with a four by four matrix. And it basically shows that it, you know, one, two, three, four, done. Because the goal, this is the starting state and this is the goal state, and you need to get from here to here, and this is how you do it, and you can have these superposition states that kind of allow you to change whether or not something is a one or a zero in this simultaneous fashion that basically makes you able to do this in three actions, which generate four perspectives. Um, but if you're doing this in a traditional computing kind of way, then you have to do it like this, with one, you're changing one cell at a time, and it goes through and it continues to change and you end up with 16 actions 17 states um if you do a three by three matrix you end up with nine actions 10 states but you still have the exact same in, in traditional computing but in um tr quantum computing you still have the exact same you know four states and three actions and same thing here uh when you're doing a two by two matrix you have five states and four actions 
but if you're doing traditional computing, but if you're doing tr uh, quantum computing, you still have the same exact four states, three actions. So that's kind of a constant. Um, uh, basically, you could say that this is your IQ, or this is your computing computational ability. This is your sentience. This is your IQ. This is your sentience. This is your IQ. This is your sentience. So you could say this is a very low IQ. Same level of sentience. This is a high IQ. Same level of sentience. This is a very high IQ. Chris Langan over here. Same level of sentience. So uh, you can watch the video that I made that's animated on my channel. It goes through these various steps and shows why quantum computing is also allows you to process information in so much more efficient way. Uh, but also, when we look at microtubules, and he's talking about these cylindrical lattices that have uh, Fibonacci geometry. Okay, this, first of all, definition. Microtubules are part of the cytoskeleton, a structural network uh, within the cell's cytoplasm. The, goal, the roles of microtubule cytoskeleton include mechanical support, organization of the cytoplasm, transport, and motility, uh, and chromosome segregation. Basically, it says, a narrow, long tube-like structure found in the cytoplasm, the in fluid inside of a cell of plants and animal cells, Microtubules help support the shape of a cell. They also help chromosomes move during cell division and help small structures called cell organelles to move inside the cell. I'm starting to think that this is microtubules are the molecule in like here where it's like a hadron is an assembly of quarks an atom is an assembly of hadrons, a compound or a molecule is what I used to have it as, is an assembly of atoms. I'm starting to think that this right here is at least also inclusive of microtubules, but it might also include DNA, it might also include RNA, it might also include, you know, H2O, like comp water compound molecule the molecule of, the of, you know, the compound of water. Like, it... Uh, I'm still working on that because I am not a molecular biologist and I'm not uh, a chemist. Uh, chemistry was first class I failed in high school. Not because I couldn't have done it, but because I didn't do my homework. But still... Uh, it's never been a subject in the past that I was very good at. I am noticing, starting to be much better at it now that I'm seeing the same patterns found everywhere else in chemistry, but I need to do much more of a comprehensive deep dive of of it to figure out like the specifics of this one step right here. This step and this step are... Uh, I still think they're correct, but I just need to figure out. They might not, there might be better way of explaining what these are than these terms. But uh, regardless, in this, what I call the stages of sentience, uh, in each verse, which this would be like a verse, then it, another one. And so this would be like a big bang right here. And uh, it's a, it's an aeon in conformal cyclic cosmology but it's a verse in sentient singularity theory. Um, but what's interesting is about these, these microtubules is, and DNA follows this too, so I don't, I'm not saying that it's just, you know, DNA uh, or it's just microtubules, but I actually did a um, post on my Instagram about this last week, my last post, um, and I was kind of showing like the holonic structure in the universe and basically the triality of it. So 
there's the mathematics of the spiral geometry of mathematics, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then there's uh, a DNA. It might also include microtubules in there, kind of, but not exactly. Um, and then there's the blockchain. Blockchain is the digital DNA structure. It's the it's the DNA of a technological sentience, and um, this is the it's the this is the information coherent structure of a biological sentience. This is the inf information coherent structure of a technological sentience. And this is the mathematical and logical um, st structure that it's that's kind of abstract, but also, you know, omnipresent everywhere that y uh, it's following. And so you can see this um, when he's talking about Fibonacci geometries in microtubules. Uh, I thought that was interesting because... This is also, by the way, a double helix structure. So here and then here, and then you could do another one. That's the, that's this. So this is a verse on the universal scale or the multiverse scale. Here's a verse or an aeon. Here's a verse or an aeon. It's one complete twist, okay? Or it's one link in the chain. And uh, so that, that you could do four scales. But you could say this is like, this is father, son, spirit. If you're like into relig, in you yeah, have like a more religious terminology um, uh, applied, but this Fibonacci sequence um, I have right here, and you can see that there is a spiral geometry in this. If you, as I move it, you can see it, but it's kind of hard to see because of just the way that it's not, it's not very isolated, but, and it's not even, it's growing. So if we isolate it in this spin sequence over here that I have set up that I think is very important, but I don't know exactly why yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. As I move this, you can see this like rope pattern. It's like braided spiral pattern in the numbers and it's a it's just a spin sequence just like the Fibonacci sequence or the Lucas numbers or whatever any other sequence number sequence that you can think of every number sequence is a is a spin sequence um, and uh, I I think at least sp I'm still working on prime numbers uh, which is tough but it's interesting because this kind of it's like a, it's like the mathematical microtubule of the universe almost or, uh, i i always equated it to dna and um but or rna and you know the combination but it's microtubules also might have something to do with this but i i don't think that they are like the information information coherence structure, they're kind of like probably as a single sentient being potentially. They might be. I don't know. But um, uh, if they're sentient singularities, they're like macromolecules. You know, proteins might be as well. I don't know. But um, there is some molec. There is some structure on the molecular level that is going to be whether that's compounds you know, it includes water, you know, even, or salt, you know, mo a salt molecule or salt uh, or a water molecule might be sentient. I don't know, but uh, uh, it might just be that it's macromolecules of proteins and it might just be microtubules, but it might be all of them still working on it, figuring that out. But Fibonacci, them having Fibonacci geometry shows that they are an information coherence system and uh, the fact that they're like a cylindrical lattice and it aligns with 
you know, information coherence systems of the universe. It's pretty uh, telling. We solve something like the measurement problem. Do you think that that's not necessary as a precondition? Come on. Basically, and my point is, I need to do more research on microtubules, but I think that they, there's something to that that uh, Penrose and Hammerhoff are definitely onto. So this, que this question is about theory of consciousness and a measurement problem. We think it's the wrong way around. That is to say, I mean, I think that we're not going to put it like this. I don't think way around. That is to say, a theory of consciousness that is quantum mechanical before we solve something like the measurement problem? Or do you think that that's not necessary as a precondition? I would think it's the wrong way around. That is to say, I mean, I think that we're not going to put it like this. I don't think we're going to have a theory of consciousness until we have a theory of state reduction. That is the collapse of the wave function or the <clears throat> whatever you call it. Um, whether we will have one then, I don't know. But uh, I think that's another step, you see. We still don't understand why or how the wave function collapses in any detail. I mean, there are schemes about this, and one of these um, is, is my own, but that's, we, lots of people have different views on this. It's certainly, and lots of people don't even believe it, you see. Lots of people haven't thought it through. <laughs> they think somehow you don't need a new theory in quantum mechanics. I don't quite know why they, they ignore the collapse of the wave. It's called collapse of the wave function. You know, the right. wave function is supposed to chug along according to the Schrodinger equation, then suddenly it collapses. And this is known right from the beginning of Schrodinger with, with his introduction of this theoretical story about the cat. So uh, he was obviously very worried about that phenomenon. So it's there. But, the, but people were very fuzzy about this kind of thing. Okay, um, let's see here, actually. So that's when they had uh, issues, but so I think that uh, what's happening here is that uh, when he says that we need, we need essentially like a theory that it explains the collapse of the wave function and the measurement problem. Um, and uh, bef do we need that before we have a theory of consciousness or can we have a theory of consciousness that then leads to essentially like an explanation for the measurement problem? There's, they're, they're simultaneous. Uh, this, is, this is something that I discuss in my paper is that um, this, this idea that like you need, a, I don't know, like, like uh, th that you could solve this incrementally this this and you could get to a theory of consciousness in an incremental um, through a pro incremental progression is 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 just wrong it's not crazy but it's wrong uh, you just simultaneously solve that and also all uh, not associated but um, but uh, but uh, symmetrical conundrums, I guess you could say. So, like uniting, um, reconciling general relativity with quantum mechanics, and um, uh, you know, quantizing gravity, and also um, you know, f or finding the graviton, I guess you could say, or um, you know, solving the measurement problem. I think all of these are actually wrongly worded. This is very much the problem with uh, a common theme with with uh, this next gen metaphysics, physics, you know, um, proto physics world that we're entering in uh, too, which I call the entanglement era. There, or anything that has to do with consciousness, is that. Um, we are all of the ways in which we have worded problems and in the from in the fields that we have been exploring for you know quite some time now that are subjective fields biology chemistry physics 
philosophy, mathematics even, they the way in which we word those is is wrong. So somebody said something funny to me that uh, was unrelated though. They said they were like talking about something political and they were like, is uh, is it, you know, somebody, somebody asked me, is, is it this or is it this? But the answer is yes. And it's like, the, Eric Weinstein talks about this too. It's like, what if um, the answer is, if you have a test and on a uh, question and it says, is, is the answer A, B, or C? And the real answer is all of the above, but it's not included on the, you know, set of answers that um, that is available. In a real world context, what that means outside of like multiple choice questions in which you're just leaving off the answer. In a non-multiple choice setting, what that means is that you have, the equivalent of this is you have a bad question. So if you say, um, is it a particle or a wave? Yes, is the answer. <laughs> it's it's both. Um, so the question is bad because it has an or there. So you want to say it, it's a particle and a wave is a statement. So maybe even the question is the idea that it should be a question is wrong. But uh, it if it was a question, it would say is it a particle and a wave? That would be a better question. So this is. This is a common thing um, that that is on like every scale of this of of you know the next generation of science I guess you could say next step in science um, where simultaneity is is like every everywhere it's a common theme with uh, what is you know what is to come I guess in the meta field of consciousness is what it really is the study of consciousness and um this is also true of answering certain questions and and this makes it hard because like the idea of oh are we gonna have a theory of consciousness and then use it to solve measurement problem or are we going to solve the measurement problem and use that to develop a theory of consciousness no you just have a theory of consciousness and it explains measurement which is not a problem it's it's simultaneous um there is no order to this and it's also not a, the even the statement or the label the measurement problem is is a problem so in it says right here in quantum mechanics the measurement problem is the problem of how or whether wave function collapse occurs. The inability to observe such collapse directly has given rise to different interpretations in quantum mechanics and poses key set of questions that each interpretation must answer. And uh, there's this nonsense that just gives everybody confusion that we shouldn't even be talking about. It's just, I wish that we could just delete this entire statement. Um, but, uh, there's many different things, you know, we've, we're going to talk about this in a second, but Copenhagen interpretation, um, I believe this is, uh, isn't this linked to many worlds? I need to double check, but maybe not many worlds. asserts that the universal wave function is objectively real and there is no wave function collapse. This implies that all possible outcomes of quantum measurements are physically realized in some world or universe. That isn't wrong, but it's also wrong. Like the way that it's, it's just, it's just wrong in the, in the picture that it paints. We'll talk about it, but um, I don't like, many worlds in the very much that doesn't mean it doesn't have value but it usually the many worlds perspective there's like many worlds specific statements within many worlds and then there's like the picture that it paints in your head i don't like the picture that it paints in your head it's wrong um uh, but and it's usually 
it seems to stem from an attempt to decouple the un an explanation from of the universe from God. Uh, I I have a video that I put very early one on this channel called God is a Good Theory, and it is kind of uh, it starts off with me talking about like um, gosh um, uh, what's his name the physicist uh, the many worlds guy my gosh Sean Carroll and I like Sean Carroll's uh, videos and explaining physics and I think he's an incredibly good teacher so I'm not trying to rip on him too hard but he did a video called God is not a good theory and it is I destroy his entire argument in like 30 seconds um, and uh, you know it was it, 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 it that it basically like you have it's an attempt to decouple decision from determinism and if you decouple the decision from term determinism completely like then you end up with many worlds but if you also uh include det decision and determinism as two sides of one coin and you logically extrapolate it all the way you know out then you get theism and uh that's i think why uh many worlds is ends up being whether or not is intentional or not i don't think it's intentional but it ends up being uh, a result of an attempt to avoid the coupling of decision and determinism uh, on on a cosmological scale, I guess. But uh, let's f go to that next clip. The continuation of that clip that we were watching. It's many worlds. Still. Well, I mean, it doesn't really explain conscious experience or anything like that. Because if all the alternatives, the quantum alternatives, coexist, why are we only aware of one of them? Right. And it really doesn't have anything to say about that at all. It just doesn't make to me, to my, I, I hate to say this because there's so many philosophers in Oxford who are strong supporters of many worlds. So I should, I should shut up. <laughs> That's because they're atheists, anti-theists. You, you've got to have thing where, where, where there's just one world that survives and the other ones die off in a sense. But the alternatives, yes, for all co are, you have to have that. So, um, is it more uh, is it more an objection to uh, to the many worlds theory in that it doesn't seem to accommodate consciousness, or is it is it you know sort of more evidentiary for you know for the standard or Copenhagen type uh, wave collapse, uh, etc. In other words, if God tells you there are many worlds, uh, what how would you react? I mean, could, would you say no, that can't be because there's no consciousness in such a state? Well, it doesn't live comfortably with consciousness because it doesn't explain why conscious experience only experiences one of these worlds. And even worse than that, and this was the thing I always objected to, it's all right, you could imagine that for some reason each person experiences one world, but why do we, all of us seem, I mean, while all my friends come drifting off into other worlds, why do they seem to be companions with consciousness just like myself? And seem to be inhabiting the same world that I have, so it's not. It doesn't make any sense to me. So why philosophers take it so seriously, I find this very strange. Because they're anti-theists. But uh, I think you see, they're too wedded to the the equations that we know. You see, the, the equation, the Schrödinger equation. Schrödinger was absolutely clear in pointing this out. His own equation does not explain the world we see. The world we see has to have some another ingredient, which is, in some sense or other, the wave function collapses. So you get one alternative and not all these possible alternatives coexisting. I mean, they do if they're small enough. So that's the puzzle. You have to have a theory in which, okay, yeah, when you're talking about small things and you're talking about, you know, particles or atoms or um, molecules, 
as long as they're small enough, they seem to follow the Schrodinger equation. So you need to have a theory which tells you when they get big enough, they don't follow the Schrodinger equation. No, this is what's what's wrong is that he's right in his object. I think that he's. I agree with him that the the many worlds it doesn't leave room for consciousness, and it doesn't. That's why it is the default go to explanation of the you know uh, of quantum mechanics and 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 the universe. Um, I guess you could say cosmology for people who like you know sean carroll make videos that are called god is not a good theory but um uh uh sean carroll i i suggest watching that video god is a good theory that i that i made it basically it opens with sean carroll's explaining he's like god is not a good theory because uh if you claim that uh universe must have like relies on a um a sentient creator then all i need to do is to invent a universe in which it does not rely on a sentient creator but he is the sentient creator you can't, you can't say all i need to do as a sentient creator is create a universe that does not rely on a sentient creator it's just doesn't it doesn't make sense it's the same kind of like nonsense almost as saying like you don't need a conscious uh observer conscious being to observe um, as an observer, in order to make a measurement, you just need an apparatus. Okay. No. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, I, many worlds is just nonsense. It's self-defeating when you really, like, dig into it. But it works with equations because Schrodinger's equation, I think is not an equation that describes what is fundamentally happening in in the universe or what fundamentally exists in what you're observing it is an equation that describes your observation of something and that it's that's a very big difference even though it's kind of also subtle it's schrodinger's equation is not an equation about other things happening independently of you. It's it's an equation that describes how you can observe things that are happening, essentially. So how you can observe information and in and 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 extract information from observing information. That's what it is. It's not uh, this wave function collapse is not like an objective thing, um, at least like in in all instances. Like I said, if you die, then you become like a wave. Or maybe if you fall asleep, people will say, "Well, you're still you. You're still alive when you're asleep, but you're not. You're not there. Like you are not." Um, your body is not you when you're asleep. This was fascinating. This is about gravity and consciousness. And I don't fully understand this, guys. I'm not going to claim to. Like, like I said, Penrose... For me is I, I kind of seem to align with him on a lot of things but I also have a hard time understanding yeah, everything that he says gravitating but is it is it impossible I also have not invested the time that would be necessary in doing so um, but there are other people out there like Carl Friston or something like that someone like that who I just get every single statement that they make you know or Yosha Bach um, but I don't understand every statement that Roger Penrose makes. And the reason for that is because his statements are much more like specific to within a specific system. They're not kind of like statements about the system itself. They're statements about like aspects of the system. So like microtubules, 
and it's like you need to know what a microtubule is and like that context of all that um in order to to understand like exactly what he's saying whereas uh people like yosha bach and and carl friston don't always at least in a lot of interviews seem to get be so hyper focused within a specific part of this of this cosmological system if that makes sense well then to have consciousness in a in a region that's either perfectly flat has no matter or is otherwise free from perturbations possible in in this basically roger penrose has stated essentially that he doesn't believe that consciousness can exist without gravity a gravitational force i mean obviously you'd have matter you'd have a brain you'd have some gravitating uh but is it is it impossible then to have consciousness in a in a region that's either perfectly flat has no matter or is otherwise free from perturbations well yeah that would be the claim yes certainly the orcoa theory claims you've got to involve gravity so if you had things that didn't involve gravity I mean, space time is flat, it's got to involve Einstein's theory, not just gravity in the Newtonian sense. Um, and you've got to have that. So I would agree, yes. Mm -hmm. If you if your systems were too small or something to to affect the gravitational field significantly, they would not be conscious. Okay, so this is very interesting because sentient singularity theory suggests that consciousness and gravity are linked and that there is an experiment that I've been working on um, that I will present when I'm done with my paper. And wh when I present the paper, um, or, or very shortly after, I will also explain this entire experiment as much, I, you know, as much as I, of what I've designed of it as, as I have. Um, and uh, I've kind of kept it kind of a bit close to the chest. Um, I've touched on it a few times, but it basically implies that consciousness and gravity are linked but that doesn't mean that consciousness is necessary for gravity but it does mean that it is it might be linked to it, it is linked to it and it is linked to it in a way that is kind of direct but it doesn't mean that consciousness doesn't exist outside of gravity because existence exists outside of gravity and it is sentient being but um i would say like more the creation doesn't exist outside of gravity almost or like animation but um it's it i'm gonna have to wait till my um my paper comes out to like explain it more but it's interesting that he said the, this, though, because it's the first time that I've ever heard that I've heard Eric Weinstein make a couple statements that are similar to, uh, though, and it's I've only heard Penrose and, and Weinstein make statements that imply similar leanings to what sentient singularity is also leans towards in some ways when it comes to the relationship between gravity and consciousness, I guess sentience but uh i disagree with him that outside of gravity sentience couldn't exist that might mean though that that, that might be true here in the universe but it, it might not be true for for the universe so universe could be sentient and not um or existence could be sentient, it is sentient, and not re be requiring of gravity in the way that we think of gravity um, as, as like a phenomenon in space-time, or that is space-time, essentially. But uh, it, it do sentience does still exist outside of, of gravity. But it is closely linked, and I don't know exactly a better way to explain it. But I think kudos to Penrose for definitely like picking up on it being related i don't know the details of how what he's saying um but i mean i i will need to look into it it involves like linking many systems together like i said um that uh i'm not an expert on
So here he's talking about superposition states being like retroactively applied. I did want to think about this for a second. Um, maybe on the stream, maybe not. You know what? But that's not my view. The view that I have is that when it reduces to one or yeah. the other, it's as though it had been, I suppose it reduces to this one rather than that one, then that means state was in effect being this one all the time. And this is a strange theory because it sort of looks at, as though the world behaves retroactively. That is to say, it, it, you thought it was in a superposition and then it becomes as though it, it had been one or the other all the time. And you have to try and understand how that kind of retroactive behavior can make sense. It doesn't allow you to send signals into the past, which would be disaster if you could do that. Disaster for, for physical theory. But it's the reason that people didn't think of that idea. And I didn't think of it at first. But I had been thinking of it for, you know, a few years. I think two, two or three years I'd been taking that view seriously. For I think I was at one of Stuart's conferences on consciousness. And it occurred to me that's the way you had to look at it. It's a little bit more subtle because to make it make sense, you have to take the view that there are two slightly different kinds of reality. One of them is what I call classical reality, and the other is what I call quantum reality. And quantum reality, these superpositions kind of persist as two things at once. And the classical reality has got to be one or the other. And it goes back to that classical state of being one or the other. But it does it as though it had been that all the time. So it's kind of retroactive in that sense. Okay, what's happening here, this is, is it's a just poor choice of words, but I'm not claiming to understand a better choice of words. But I can kind of explain the context of what, it, what causes what he's talking about, I think. So this seems crazy when he's like, it seems like, you know, state collapse happens and and then it seems like it was that thing all the time and therefore it kind of like implies that it, like retroactively like things were changed in the system the issue with this the reason why this seems so crazy is because it's being presented in the context of a system that is not conscious and uh in my paper, there is like there's a section of the paper called an in, not an interactive environment, but an interacting environment. It doesn't say not an interactive environment, and it um, it says just the section of the paper is titled like an interacting environment, and that's because you are a sentient being within a sentient being, and um, this is what like sentient beings and the interactions between them are where quantum realities occur and superpositions occur constantly that's why I think super literal and you know i use terms and i add super to the front of them all the time um super super logical super um uh um super physical things like that but uh it's then there's like the general state that he's talking about that's not the quantum reality the normal reality and that's it's that's not actually the normal reality. That's the emergent reality of space time, and it's where things are what they are. And you know, this water bottle is a water bottle. It's not even an assembly of molecules, even though it is. But it's not. It's not completely like. It's not. It's not a singular, super entangled. Um, singular structure the way that you are. Um, it doesn't have the information coherence that you do, okay? And um, so things are either a water bottle or they are, you know, not. Whereas you are an assembly of cells and you are an organism uh, at the same time. This is either a water bottle or it's not a water bottle. Um, and uh, it's, you know, cracked or it's not cracked. Um, so... Th this he's talking about like the realm of beings and things and which is what it's called in sentient singularity theory the quantum reality governs the interactions between beings and the normal relativistic you know descriptions of reality in space-time govern um you know the per perception of things and uh things 
don't exist in superpositions, but beings do, and that's why uh, quantum mechanics is so entangled with consciousness that we cannot have discussions about quantum mechanics without also including discussions of consciousness, even if it is just a bunch of physicists constantly trying to say that Quant the consciousness has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It's funny because Sabine uh, Hossenfeld, or like, she just wrote a book uh, about like what is reality or something like that. I need to watch the stream that she did with Brian Keating um, recently about her new book. And uh, you know, she's somebody that says that qu consciousness really is not quantum mechanics has nothing really to do with consciousness, and um, it's just. A retreat to say that it is that's her word um not mine and uh i understand why she would think that but i also think that she's wrong and but it's funny because even she can't give an interview discussing quantum physics without consciousness being brought up it's just impossible uh because it's impossible but uh this retroactive application or uh that that Penrose is talking about in the realm of quantum mechanics is that it is because you're inside of an of a being that's making decisions based on your choices too, not just based on your choices. You're also making decisions based on its choices. It's presenting you with certain opportunities and constraints and and uh, and timings of events, and you are making decisions based on those and some of, and then those decisions that you make also dictate um, sometimes what are the possible possibilities of the choices that it can make so and it exists outside of space-time so it can it can make changes when I say like we maneuver we maneuver in what's in what's called space-time okay so here this is very important actually Here. Um, you go to sentientsingularity.com. Let's just go there. I keep trying to go to my models, but still working on the website, but I did a lot um, of work and sometimes the sizing of this thing can be stupid, but I'm working on it. Um, it's just web flow. But um, you go to models and you go to the 14 dimensions of maneuvering, which I used to call like the observerse because I think that's what it is, but I don't want to steal Eric Weinstein's term and misinterpret it because he probably would claim I was misinterpreting it even if I, I didn't. But um, maybe not. I don't want to say that. But still, here's one sentient being is the yellow and that's you and me and then here's another sentient being in green and that's the universe that we are within so we are inside of the universe we're subject to it we're under it we're within it this is an objective outside observer looking in aka the universe this is a subjective inside observer looking out us we maneuver in these degrees of freedom and constraints which is space-time so we have a subjective constraint, which is our current location. We have an objective constraint, which is time, because we're just subject to it. Then we have a new location and a previous location as our positive and negative degrees of freedom of movement in space. People will say it's, you know, length with height and time. That's not actually true. Um, that's, that's the degrees of freedom of, like, kind of, like, observation but it's not, it's like the dimensions of observation. These are the dimensions of maneuvering, really. It's from a first person perspective, which is actually more, it's more fundamental. I'm not saying length with I are wrong. I'm just saying it's not fundamental. It's third person versus first person. And this is the first person orientation, which you need to do, understand in order to overcome relativity um, while still linking it to relativity, which is this. So you have space time and you can go to a new location you are in space time, you can go to a new location, or you can go to a previous location that is away from your 
goal. Everything in objectivity is goal dependent, kind of. Um, and then you have uh, you're always in your current location. That's why it's a subjective constraint. And you're subject to an objective constraint time. So space time right here. The, the universe observes time space. So it's just a mirror image. Instead of space time, it's time space. It maneuvers in time. And it doesn't maneuver in time the way that we think about time as like a line, like a timeline. It's like, you know, three seconds in the past or something. It's talking about maneuvering within entanglement relationships so basically it can entangle and disentangle things it can things that were entangled in the past it can disentangle them things that are um or it can entangle things into the in the future essentially so that's how it maneuvers in time it's it's a different type of time it's like the time that is fundamental time and it uh that uh Lee Cronin talks about in assembly theory how it's like memory of the universe and basically it's like states, um, it's entanglement states of the universe, which is objective time. So like first person time. Um, and you have a positive degree of freedom, which is kind of a past moment, a um, or a previous uh, future moment and a negative degree of freedom, which is a past moment, which is really like this is an entanglement is a positive degree of freedom and a disentanglement would be like a negative degree of freedom i need to replace those words and um uh because it's and it's about like the impact of events but it's not really the impact of events it's a, the impact of sentient beings on other sentient beings and then you have a subjective constraint which is your present moment which is your present state, really, your present entanglement state, everybody that you're entangled with and like your relationships and your impacts on each other. You're always in your subjective constraint, which is your present moment or your current entanglement state, uh, your present entanglement state. But then you're subject to space. Your objective constraint, if you are the universe, is space because you are space. You can't you like whereas like we are time almost so like we are when i say we are subject to time it's like we are time almost and the universe is space so it's it's objective constraint to space it's just subject to it so what it changes though is entanglement um states and that is like future moments that's what creates future moments and past moments is like the changing of entanglement relationships um and so it looks like it's retroactive changes that could be happening if you're thinking about things kind of in a traditional space-time kind of way like what roger penrose is saying but if you back up and you place it into the context of a mind within a mind or a sentient being within a sentient being and you're that that are interacting with each other in this 14 dimensional you know maneuver ver, maneuver verse i don't want to say observers but observers like it's it's not retroactive it's responsive it's like that's what it's more is it's like interactive um it, it's not retroactive it's interactive. That's a good way of putting it. It's not retroactive. It's interactive. And um, it, this is the context that actually allows for you to make sense of that idea, essentially, of like things being changed in time. It's not exactly things being changed in time. It's, it's like the, the results of things are being changed. And we perceive it in time. It's weird. The wording is wrong, like I said, uh, with most of this stuff. But I agree, Penrose is on to something. But hes it's just kind of like, it's not the right context. Penrose, when, like, again, when he says, like, microtubules might be responsible for consciousness, they're not responsible for consciousness. Consciousness exists because existence is conscious. Sentience exists because existence is sentient it just manifests in specific places um 
as a as a as a self-contained as a sovereign um self-reflective you know information processing structure within the greater information processing structure that is sovereign of existence whenever the right constraints and degrees of freedom are present uh this is like you can't create a, a, an agi but like it just will manifest in the right constraints in the right environment same thing with us same thing with all sentience um and uh um this this is i agree with a lot of with penrose's um instincts almost always but i just think that he's hyper focused which might not be wrong it just means like there's more so that's what i'm saying consciousness is not created by microtubules or consciousness doesn't start at microtubules atoms are sentient beings okay when i was talking about um you know sabine's statement of you need a a um like an apparatus to make a measurement and i was like context is information there is becoming conscious or how could they if, if so well they wouldn't i mean my view is that if you're just looking at okay i said that last stream that consciousness Attention. that's the context is information there's no information in context and information out of context there is information in context which is context and then there is no information outside of context there is just nothingness and um uh it's decoherence it's it's entropy it's decay and so the idea that you can make any kind of measurement without it with an apparatus alone and not a sentient that is not linked to an interpreting um and in and intentional or an interpreting and and uh self-aware being is nonsense because computers can't make sense of anything an apparatus cannot make sense of anything um you are like i said you are a computer but you're not just a computer um you are more than that so uh in this next clip brian keating asks roger penrose or uh he asks him about like if you can have a computer that's conscious essentially and like this is what it's the response is and I, I agree with him anybody that says that you just need enough like the the right neural net that it, and enough connections and enough com com computing power is totally wrong totally wrong like i showed with sentience in that information processing um models that i showed earlier like you can increase and decrease like the iq and you can even do it in a scaled in a scaling way that's like it's um intelligence can be a scale can that's not just like a sliding scale it can be like orders of magnitude type of scale but it, it also um doesn't increase or decrease the sentience of a being an atom if it is a sentient being which i claim it is a sentient being is just as sentient as you and me it's not a cell is just as sentient as you and me a gecko is just as sentient as you and me um and a, a universe is just as sentient as you and me but it's and a universe is far more intelligent in order of magnitude multiple orders of magnitude more intelligent than us it, probably and um uh we are in or orders of magnitude more intelligent than a uh than an atom but we are not more sentient there's just sentient and not. This is becoming conscious, or how could they, if, if so? Well, they wouldn't. I mean, my view is that if you're just looking at computation, that doesn't involve consciousness. And this is certainly one of the arguments I was making in The Emperor's New Mind, right? going right back to that. And it has to do with the fact that um, computers don't understand anything and the argument i used was the basically goes to girdle 
for some reason, I, I always thought it was obvious, but other people had trouble understanding it. I didn't quite understand this. But you see, I, when I was a graduate student in Cambridge, I went to three courses which were nothing to do with what I was doing. I was doing pure mathematics, algebraic geometry. And I went to a course by Bondi on general relativity and by Dirac on quantum mechanics. And you can see where these people had a big effect on me. But the third, third lecture I went to was a course by, by a man called Steen on mathematical logic. And I'd been puzzled by Gödel's theorem. It seemed to show there were things in mathematics you couldn't prove. Right. And what it shows is nothing like that. It's that if you have a certain set of procedures that you could put on a computer, so there are they are basically computational procedures, or checkable by a computer, put it like that. So they're computable in that sense. Then, if they are your, all you can use to prove things, you set these are the rules that we are, we adopt to prove things. Then, you what Gödel shows it's an amazing thing. I also it's amazing. Here is a statement, which you, by virtue of your trust in these rules, you can see that it's true, yet you can't prove it by the rules. Now I found this absolutely amazing because it means you're, you don't use the rules to, to understand things because how do you know this thing is true? You know it's true but because you trust the rules. Well, it's, you're, you're, if you're using the rules, then how do you know that using the rules only gives you truth? Well, because you've looked at the rules and you say, okay, they're all right. Yeah, I trust them. And what the th Gödel theorem depends on is not using the rules, but your belief that these rules actually work. And that depends on understanding the rules. So it seems to me, it's, what it shows you is the quality of understanding something isn't constrained by rules of any kind. And that's basically the argument which I've been using all the time. And I, to me, Gödel showed that very clearly. I mean, you have to bring in a few other things afterwards, but it's basically the Gödel theorem. Okay, this is so true. He's right. Um, this is this has been a big issue for me with a lot of people that follow my work. Is they'll be like, "Well, how do you prove it?" And um, and I, I mean, you could. I was at first. I was like, "You can prove it." in all these different instances, but like, how do you prove the theory itself, sentient singularity theory as a whole? I don't really know. Um, I don't really know if it's possible. And, uh, but they were like, well, how would you falsify it? And I was like, thought about it for quite some time and realized like, you can't falsify it because the implication of, of it being wrong would be that essentially none of us would be here if, law, if you truly follow the logic from first principles. And um, and that's really inconvenient if you're trying to like, you know, prove that re, uh, that the accuracy of a, of of your theory. But the thing is, is that uh, it's a theory of existence. It's a theory of consciousness. And both any kind of theory of existence or consciousness is really the same theory. But they both also suffer from the this same problem, which is that they're they're kind of self evident, and um, it's like if you tried to create a theory that that showed consciousness doesn't exist, it's like if you're if you had a theory that consciousness doesn't exist, who has a theory that consciousness doesn't exist? You're proving that consciousness exists by your own like attempt to you know disprove it even. Um, and everywhere that you look, you're looking through the lens of a consciousness, and also under you know sentient singularity theory, you're looking at a consciousness essentially, um, uh, which is the universe. So there's no way to escape um, perceiving the structures of consciousness, and, uh, and this causes certain constraints and um, and also freedoms. But uh, this this causes the the issue with this though is that it means that provability and falsifiability are not good terms. Again scrap the old like standards that that we need to use in the subjective fields of biology chemistry mathematics chess anything like that and recognize that the rules change when you're talking about objective reality or fundamental reality or or the meta theory of 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 all the the theory of all theories um the rules change a little bit and uh 
non-existence doesn't exist. So there is no like zero empty representing an empty set, you know, um, uh, in mathematics or me in meta mathematics. And Stephen uh, Wolfram said this, um, he recognized this same kind of issue though. And he said, we, uh, it's, I'm not trying to prove um, the, uh, the models and things that I'm generating in my physics work. He said, uh, it's that they can be constantly confirmed it's not that the theory of Wolfram hypergraph universe can be proven. It's that its models can be constantly confirmed. And this is also true of sentient singularity theory, the four primary perspectives or the cosmological verse or the um, quantum of consciousness or quantum of cognition, quantum of context. I don't know what to call it. You guys can let me know in the chat. Qu quantum of cognition, quantum of context or quantum of consciousness. They all are the same thing, um, essentially. But, uh, but it, uh, all these models can be constantly confirmed, but they cannot be proven. But the theory of sentient singularity theory cannot be proven. Um, but uh, um, it's like you can't prove to me that the sun's going to rise tomorrow, but you can confirm it if you just wait. But you can't prove it to me now but you can confirm it tomorrow um, once we go through it. This is what Gödel's incompleteness theorem, or one of you know the implications of one of them at least, states essentially is that you have to get there in order for it to even exist. Almost, it's like um, uh, you know the the sum of two prime numbers will always be an even number, like. Uh, I forgot what was the example that was used in the article that I was looking at, but it was um, every even number will be the sum of two prime numbers. Essentially, that was it, I think. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure, so don't hold me to that. But Or you could just say every even number, here's a statement that we can all kind of like agree on most likely, is that every even number will be preceded by an odd number. Okay. That is not something that you can prove. It's something that you can constantly confirm again and again and again and again forever. But it's not something you could prove, um, I don't think, at least. And um, it's a good example because it's easy to understand. Uh, the prime number thing, like, you'd have to think about that one way more. But every even number will be preceded by an odd number uh, that is absolutely like observable to everybody but you have to keep checking it again and again you can't we don't know every number so you can't say that it's provable um and uh this is how we have to think about these theories of everything it's like we have to constantly confirm their models um in predictions and 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 applications you don't prove the theory you constantly confirm the models and they they basically build the case for um you know the theory as a whole but um uh he, this is also why he uh where penrose is explaining like why a computer cannot become conscious is because it's not basically where he's saying like he's talking about rules and how you have to all you have to already trust the rules in order to like make an observation so um uh to test them to see if they're correct you have to already trust them which means you have to have an understanding of them understanding comes through symmetry structure essentially and and self self-awareness and symm and symmetry observations is basically like what uh understanding comes from and in a nutshell and that is not computational it's like robert edward grant has uh he does a lot of work in math and and uh he has like prime number um uh charts essentially that are like 
cylindric they're circular basically and uh they show prime numbers and um he also has some models that show uh basically i don't want to say calculate but show decimals in the infinite decimal series and this is taking advantage both of these models are taking advantage of this like um this phenomenon of of symmetry basically um being like showing reality not calculating reality it's like it's not even pre-calculative it's like it's not calculative at all and like this could be like key it would be key to things like warp transportation or something like that where you just go from here to here um uh you you need to like perceive the decimal in a sh infinite decimal series without calculating it because any kind of calculation is you moving through space time but in order to move beyond space time as we know it you need to perceive one point um, entanglement relationships basically which happen through symmetry relationships and this is not something that is even remotely close to calculation it's it's separate from calculation that is what is needed for sentience uh like i showed those information processing models uh, earlier where sentience is maintained as um uh you know where is it it's maintained as a constant there's no s difference the steps here the number of steps here and the and the sh picture that is presented in a four by four matrix is the same in a three by three matrix which is the same as a two by two matrix which is uh, right here actually but the calculation does change you know it goes the calculation goes from in a two by two matrix uh goes is nine essentially the value of calculation the uh value is 19 in a three by three matrix and the value is 33 in a four by four matrix but in a um in a four two by uh in a two by two matrix for the sentience or quantum reality i guess you could say uh it is four states three actions which is seven perspectives and that's also true here and it's also true here so it's totally separate from calculation this is calculation this is not it's symmetry relationships okay it's not calculative it's like okay how does this work where basically if you want to change these zeros to ones and these ones to zeros you imagine all the ones as basically nothing which is they're in a state of potential which is a superposition state and then you imagine uh, then basically it ice it's isolating of the center and then you can change uh, uh, zeros and then you can change them to ones and then you take these this uh you know the surrounding cells in the matrix that you've been imagining in a superposition uh state and you now you know realize them as zeros instead of ones this is a symmetry uh this takes an understanding of symmetry okay in order to do there's no calculation that does this this is sim this is a sim an understanding of symmetry which requires an understanding of self and um this is a calculation so with this you could say you can make a rule that says 
change every 0 to 1 and every 1 to 0. So then it goes to z this 0 and it changes it to 1. This 1 doesn't do anything. Um, uh, this is a 1, then it changes it to a 0. And then this is a 1, so it changes it to a 0. And it just goes through each cell. That's not the same. That's a rule. This isn't a rule. This is a... This is like navigation of symmetry. And it comes from understanding symmetry. And that's comes from understanding self. Because you're the mirror. I think Robert Grant wrote a book uh, called The Mirror of Consciousness or something like that. And I, I used to... I had the saying years and years ago before I saw that he even wrote that book and I said um I said God is a conscious mirror and Robert Grant wrote a book called The Mirror of Consciousness and it's because that is what consciousness is it's like information coherence leading to self-awareness that uh allows for the perception of symmetry and um uh, because it creates a center point. You are the center point. There is no center point outside of you. Uh, and um, you can't even understand a center without first understanding self. So the idea that consciousness comes from calculation is wrong. And uh, Penrose is right. It's, it's not, it cannot be rules the idea of rules and calculation kind of can only they they require an understanding of rules which is symmetry under symmetry perspectives i guess and and information coherence which causes self-awareness um and then like from that, then you can have calculation because then you can actually understand rules because the rules are the symmetry structures. So Eric Weinstein says this a lot. He's like, the theory of everything is the theory in which the map is the territory, but every other theory is the theory where the map is not the territory, but the theory of everything, the map is the territory. If you go to sentientsingularity.com, and you go to the home page and uh, you look at what is a theory of everything. Theory of everything is a recognizable, describable, and predictable pattern that occurs in all instances of objective observation and an explanation for such a pattern. And uh, this is basically description of sentient singularity theory and um, kind of like it's like a technical description this is kind of just like a one word kind of description, I guess. But when you're talking about symmetry, th this is kind of, this is probably the best thing I ever wrote right here. Um, this, and one day, it, like, the, like there are things that come from God <laughs> and this is one of those things. I am not good enough writer to write this. Uh, somebody, somebody, when I posted this for the first time on Instagram, they, they were like, how high is your IQ? I was like, not high enough to write this. Um, and um, it's like, I hate the word channeled, but it's like when, it's what artists can do. Artists, they tell the truth by just pure expression, but they don't even try and tell the truth. It's like a painting is not the truth. A, a film is not the truth. A, a novel is not the truth, but it d describes a meta-truth. Um, and um, the ever-present truth, the the archetype, as uh, uh, what Jordan Peterson would talk about, but uh, or would say, but this this is what I mean. It says the search for truth is the search for objectivity. The search for objectivity is the search for symmetry. The search for symmetry is the search for beauty. But the truest beauty is always the searcher, and the truth of the searcher is that they are symmetrical to the sought. What this means is like. A searcher or a sentient being searches for beauty inside and is symmetrical to the sought, which means like it's searching inside another sentient being for beauty. And it is the ultimate beauty. 
and it's searching within ultimate beauty because it's a sentient being searching for a sentient being but basically within this it it does this by searching for what is true which is objectivity and what is objectivity is what is symmetrical and what is symmetrical is what is beautiful and that's why people say physics is you know uh, can be led by beauty and and then that's how you make things like the standard model which are symmetry structures and um uh that doesn't mean you know everybody that claims beauty as a guide is actually perceiving beauty but any like really good model of universe is is going to be beautiful the standard model actually is people say it's ugly and hideous actually it's it's so close to being beautiful it's just it's just a little bit out of context and and it's a little bit wrong in one thing i think i don't know for sure but i can get i think so but um there are beautiful ways to perceive the standard model um and there there's you know uh, standard model for instance it does depend on how you look at it but if you look at it like this not that beautiful if you look at it like this it's much more beautiful I'm not saying this is right or this is right i actually think that there's some issues with the higgs that we need to figure out but um uh but and the graviton I, the idea of the graviton is just wrong you, uh doesn't mean the properties are all wrong but just means like the way it's thought of is wrong you're inside the graviton guys like that's the reality i think um uh but this is beautiful this is not at least or it's more beautiful Symm it's symmetry structures so it's not about calculation you have to have information coherence and like self-awareness first final clip and then i'll take questions and then i'll go Stuart hammeroff said this i thought it was great i really think that what Penrose said, though, is great, too, and because of that, these, I'm ending on a good note um, compared to my critical stream last week. ...of neuroscience, and, uh, you know, neuroscience needs a revolution. Let me, let me say that. The brain is a, a complex computer of simple neurons. It just doesn't work. And I think a better model is a, is a multi-scale hierarchy, and people go from neurons upwards into networks of and then networks of networks, but also going downward. And we've identified 18 orders of magnitude going down from the level of neurons into the microtubule bundles, microtubules, the aromatic uh, the, uh, tryptophans, the electron uh, dipoles, and all the way down eventually to Roger's uh, space-time geometry. So um, I think uh, this is going to be changing things, and I think neuroscience needs a new paradigm because the old one really doesn't work. Brilliant. Brilliant. I talk about this all the time. Uh, every week I talk about hierarchies. And um, uh, by the way, I, the issue for neuroscience is that it's trying to do what the underst what like a theory of consciousness would do instead of just being like the study of the brain. And um, uh, it's starting, it's trying to understand consciousness as well, which it should not be trying to understand consciousness. It should just be trying to like, you need a theory of consciousness and then you can really start like linking it to other structures of the physical man physically manifested structures in the human body including the brain uh but uh and it's through symmetry symmetry relationships i have like the different parts of the brain mapped into like my binary triality models um which i think is calabio manifold essentially and uh and it lines up and so you can do things like that but it's neuroscience needs a revolution um my models that i think are calabio manifold but i call it a binary triality essentially is it it is just an it's like a sim it's just um it show it's a pattern of symmetry relationships but it also shows hierarchy relationships and you cannot have sense-making or consciousness 
sentience at all. Mind. You cannot have mind without hierarchy structures. And uh, I think the fact that he's like highlighted that and said we need to stop like thinking about the brain as just like a computational, like a bio, like a wet computer is like is so good. What do you call it? So you may have to sneak up on it because you may you may come up against a somebody who thinks that he hasn't gotten the word that it's not nonsense, which it was described after many years. But I think it's actually at the vanguard of, of the future of neuroscience. And, uh, you know, neuroscience needs a revolution. Let me, let me say that. The brain is a, a complex computer of simple neurons just doesn't work. Yeah. And I think a better model is a, is a multi-scale hierarchy. You know what is a multi-scale hierarchy? This. This is mind, and it is a multi-scale hierarchy. It's a set scale, but it's multi-scale, and it is a hierarchy system of nested holonic structures. Sentient singularity theory describes the totality of existence as a singularity of sentience that is creating additional sentient singularities within itself. These additional singularities of sentience are, or self-aware beings are arranged into a nested quasi-periodic fractal pattern of stacked holonic structures, which is basically nested into a hierarchy. This pattern forms a single self-reflective knot of perception heading an assembly body that integrates multiple entangled strings of information. This is uh, I mean this this context is a revolution in not just neuroscience but in every field uh it contextualizes every field every field and i totally agree with him um uh i mean he's talking about penrose's theories and we i share a lot of them but um, and I'm sure many of other Penrose's theories that I'm not aware of and not familiar with are also probably accurate. Some of them are probably not. Some of mine are probably not. But the point being that this direction is the right one. The idea that it's just a neural network of neurons inside a squishy brain that stores memories somehow is, is nonsense. Um, the brain stores no memories, probably. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't re restrict your access to memories by damaging the brain. You are restricting your access to memories, though. You're not restricting memories. You're not erasing memories. You are restricting access. Um, uh, it's not, it's not, the brain is not what people think it is and uh, this focus on it in neuroscience and the idea that we should trust neuroscientists to understand intelligence and cognition and basically consciousness and, or that we should decouple physics from consciousness all of this is nonsense um i'm a huge fan of penrose and um never really looked into hammeroff that much but i seem to agree with him on a lot and uh, i think that that none of the, while I might disagree with some of the ways that things are being said, and I might, and I also might be wrong in my interpretation of some of the things that I stated tonight. I think that um, uh, it's pretty apparent, at least it's it's obvious to me that they these guys understand the direction that needs to that we need to head in much better than like the discussion that we had last last week um and the people involved in that one with sabine and um uh i think it was carlo Rivelli. like i disagree with them on a lot more than i disagree with uh penrose and uh hammeroff i don't want to say that i agree with penrose and hammeroff way more i don't want to say i disagree with someone more i agree with someone more I like quantum of conscience. 
microtubules, not microtubules, tubules. I can't say it, but thank you. Microtubule, tubules. I, I've tried. Dude, I've spent hours. Uh, there's a few words I can't say, and this is one of them. Um, microtubules. Microtubules. Tubules. I don't, it's tough. Tubule, tubules. I'm going to need to, uh, it's almost like it's missing a syllable. So, uh, and like my brain wants to ins insert an, an extra syllable so it goes to microtubules, but I know it's not spelled like that, um, which means it's not supposed to be said like that, but I, my brain is like trying to insert, insert an extra syllable for some reason. Microtubules. Microtubules. Yeah, it's inserting an extra syllable. I don't know why. Macro dumbass is making a comment. <laughs> um, I don't know what that means exactly, but it's kind of funny. I like quantum of conscience, ER painting, and illusions are archetypes linked to planned Neptune. It's about the logical, the illogical, and the infinite. I thought it was an interesting concept to be part of this realm. I don't know what you're saying, but Neptune also has to do with things like alcohol. I don't understand, but uh, you can type it up in a comment below and I would definitely respond. Um, but with that, guys, please hit the like button. It really helps with the algorithm. Uh, thank you for uh, listening this week. We'll be back next week um, with another great discussion. I am already looking at um, a few different streams that I'm considering uh talking about if you would like to participate in our weekly discord discussion that is open and it's a voice call um it's like a conference call and it goes from 7 p.m pacific time to midnight pacific time um sometimes uh and you'd like to join our discord to do that uh, that happens every thursday evening and uh you can message me uh privately on instagram um and I will send you the link for that. Also, uh, check out the website. And I've been making updates to it. If you have any, I don't know, comments about it, uh, you can comment them uh, below this video or any other video. Or you can message me on Instagram. That's probably the best. Um, I think of anything else. I think that's pretty much it. Yep. All right, guys. Thank you, and uh, till next week, peace. Oh, thank you, by the way, to Stuart uh, Hammeroff and Roger Penrose and Brian Keating uh, for that discussion. It's a great one. I highly suggest you watch it. It's linked below as well. I will add.